many responsibilities. You must find a way of using some of the time to sleep, some of the time to work, some of the time to be the family, some of the time to earn our daily bread. When you talk about living a balanced life, it's ensuring your 24 days are well catered for. But it's also talking about you are weak. In the time of the week, there are things you do during the weekday, and there are things you do over the weekends. There is time for going to assemble together with the saints. There is time for fellowship. There is also time to earn your daily bread. And we talk about a balanced life. It will mean in that one week, there is nothing critical for the week which you have actually forgotten. And it's exactly the same with looking at one month. There are things that you must accomplish within the month. And by the end of the month, you must see, did I accomplish all of them? And the same thing with the one year. There are things to do, including taking leave and stopping your normal day-to-day -day living and starting to eat what you have worked without necessarily working and therefore relaxing. And it's important that in a year, you have some time when you are actually taking leave, not working, just resting and enjoying the time with God and family. And that's right. Then there's also the question of seasons of life. There are things you do before you are married, which you must stop after you are married. Obviously, I'm addressing myself to Paminas and uh, Anthony, who got married not too long ago. And I'm saying you can't continue living your life as a married person. The way you lived it when you are single, your time allocation has to change. And uh, again, that is after you are married. Within no time, like now, Paminas, as a baby, your time structure is again changed. You, you insist on being the way you are when you are just the two of you, Mr. and Mrs., there will be a problem because in the end, you haven't really done what, what, was, uh, what was expected of you because you have you not used your time well. And that will be quite a, quite a problem. You know, if you are in older years like myself, you must learn how to allocate time to your immediate family, you must allocate time to your grandchildren, which was not available and was not an issue in years gone by. So when you talk about a balanced life, it means understanding the season of your life and ensuring you recuperate your life, not behave like where you are behaving before, although you should behave in future. Talk about your season and live according to it. You know, if you take one thing and do it well, you will be similar to the guy I call the clever fool. The clever fool was one of the best students in class. And when they came for the national exam, in a two-hour exam, he took 110 minutes to answer the first question. Why? The moment he saw the question, it happened to be the question he was revising the previous night. And he said, God, thank you. So he had so much information for the next 110 minutes, he was still answering only to wake up and realize, hey, yeah, only 10 minutes are remaining, and there are still another four questions to answer. Obviously, he was frantic, and you can guess what happened. You certainly can guess what happened. In 10 minutes, he couldn't do four questions. When the results came, he had gotten very good marks on the first question. And since each of the five questions were 20 marks each, he got 20, all the 20 marks marks he got for the first question. And fortunately, for the other four questions, he got two marks here just for having written five marks here, three marks there, two marks there. In the end, the total marks he got was less than 10. So he got about 28% of the total. Those of you who went to school after me, is that a D or a an E? I think it must be an E. So he failed. But when the, mark, the marker looks at his first question, he knows he has not failed because he is not clever. He has failed because he has not allocated his time right. And many of us, when it comes to the judgment seat of Christ, we might end up being congratulated for certain aspects of our, our lives was very well done. But unfortunately, on other areas, we, do, we didn't do well. For example, some of us are fantastic with our families. We give them all the attention. We are available to them. They are really excited about it, their father or their mother. But in terms of ministry, as soon as we got children, as soon as we got a family, we 
forgot about ministry. You cannot even be available for a fellowship of your, the team, your preaching team. You are allocated a team mission. You don't even go there. And you don't even say you are not going. So you will get full marks for allocating time and using your time properly with your family. You will get zero for ministry. Because if you have a ministry, still you are responsible. Now if you get marks in one question, and you get bad marks in all the other questions, heaven is not your home. And yet on one particular thing, you did very well. So the message for the balanced life is that it's not getting everything right. In one question is ensuring you allocate your time so that none of the areas are actually forgotten you know what you're talking about is covering all the time and i think it will be important you know much of life is a question of maintaining balance you know for example in athletics you must have a balance between offense and defense if you are playing football or playing basketball there is a, a good captain of the team who will talk about the, the offense that is attacking the other team and defense ensuring the other team doesn't score. There's also quickness and strength. Especially the strong guys will be the ones on the defense. The people at the front must be quick. But put one without the other, you would win the game. It's exactly the same in your personal finances. Yes, you must balance between expenses and the available income. We call it living within your means. Maybe it needs to be a topic we need to deal with at another time in this fellowship. The importance of living within your means. And it will be very, very important to understand when you live a balanced life, it means there isn't any one thing you are doing without and for neglecting the other. You know, this concept of work-life balance, support the effort of employees or staff to spread their time and energy between work and other important aspects of their life. To admit that even if you're an employer, an employee has other things his life demands that he does. Work level is a daily effort to make time for family, friends, community participation. The same guy who is an accountant must give time to his family. He also must give time to his friends. That's why Joe is saying the truth is him and me are friends of of all of almost 50 years, but we haven't been meeting it recently. So that means we are not allocating food and enough time for friends. And even community participation. Then spirituality, a time to grow in your faith. You know, self-care. And then other personal activities, in addition to the demands of being an employee or an employer. Work-life balance does not mean an equal balance. It doesn't mean that you allocate eight hours, eight hours, eight hours, or two hours, two hours, two hours. Trying to set you an equal number of hours for each of your various quality uh, colleagues is not clear what you are talking about when you talk about work balance, work life balance. And it should not be you and yet it's taken. Life is and should be more fluid than that. There are times when you give more time to sleep, like when you're on leave, but you still, even when you're at work, you still must sleep. Your best individual work life balance will vary over time, often on a daily basis. The right balance for you today will probably be different tomorrow. The right balance for you when you are single, like I said a little earlier, will be different from you after your marriage. Even when you actually get children, I talked about it. And uh, when you start a career as opposed to when you are nearing retirement, the balance changes with seasons. There's no perfect one size fits all balance. Don't copy somebody else. Look at your life and see whether there is a calling in your life which you are not allocating time. The best work life balance is different for each one of us because we all are different and our priorities are different. But we live life differently depending on how God has called us. You know, the real thing we are talking about is that, so that I don't go to too many issues, is let's divide your life between private personal and public. God has called you to certain things in your private life. God has called you to certain things in your personal or social life. And God has called you to your public life. Now, each one of them is actually God's calling. You can find it in the scriptures. 
and it's important. It's a big deal. We don't have the time to deal with this. For example, what is the private life? The private life is where you and God only know what is happening. And nobody can help you in that day. You can actually be very allocating a lot of time in your social life, a lot of time in your public life, and you are being mean on your private life. You end up with a real problem. The trouble with a bad architect is an architect who is building a skyscraper going up that floor, but he forgot to put a good foundation. That building is going to come down, even with a small tremor, not an earthquake, a tremor, that building. Because the higher you want the building to go, the deeper the foundation must be. So private life is something outsiders have no idea. Even your friends don't know about. Even your spouse might not know. And if you do not hear God's call in that area, then you are not living a balanced life. Quickly, I mean, if you read, if you read my book, the, uh, and there are several of them, the Christian professional in the marketplace, you will see my discussion on this area of private life. I say the private life has several things. Number one, spiritual. Are you allocating time for your personal, not your family altar? You have personal quiet time. Or is it enough when you read, you are like uh, one of the brothers are told that they are reading the Bible with, their, with the boys. That's good to do. But beyond reading with your children, you must have a personal time. When you and God meet, not your wife is not even included in it. This, your, your husband is not included in it. You need a personal life with God. And you need to meet him regularly. If you are not doing it, you are not living a balanced life. Number two, still the private area. Intellectual development. Nobody can know that you are not developing intellectually. You are no longer reading. You are what our former president called, uh, what did he call them? Uh, illiterate graduates. In other words, you have a degree. But since you left university, like me, I left university for the some years ago, you are no longer reading. You are getting functionally illiterate. Because God gave you an intellect. It's a private area for you to continually develop your mind on a long-term basis, never allowing it to rust. You are not living a balanced life when you have totally stopped growing intellectually. Number three, you are not running your private life well if you are not looking after the health of your body, physical body, by what you, by taking times of rest, by exercising, and by eating a balanced diet. So the spiritual, the intellectual, and the body is a private thing. Nobody will be able to control you. Only you know whether you are taking rest as required, whether you are taking exercise as required, whether you are taking diet. And all of those things I'm talking about are in the scriptures. So they are expected of everybody who is a worshiper of God. God expects you to grow spiritually. God expects you to grow intellectually. That's a message of Luke chapter 2, verse 52. The baby grew. Grew in stature, that physical development. He grew in wisdom, that is intellectual development. And he grew in favor with God, that spiritual development. And he grew in favor with the man, that social development. That's what all of us should be like. That's like with Jesus. We should be growing. So when you talk about living a balanced life, it means each one of those private areas, you are doing okay. Second area is what I call the social or personal life. This is the area where you have allowed a few people in. Not all people are welcome. When you talk about friends, you don't require your toes. Your fingers are already too many. Do not call acquaintances friends. And we have many acquaintances. People like me who speak. We have hundreds if not thousands of them. But the friends are people whom you open your heart to. Whom you can tell you about your failures. Who are your prayer partners. Those are few people. Do you allocate them time or not? So, those are, those, some of them are your family. Do you give your spouse? The most important of them is your spouse. Do you allocate her time? And it's not time to pray together only, although you should also pray together. They say the family are praying together, stays together. But it's family to open up. There may be questions your spouse wants to ask you. You need to give her time. So if you are not allocating your spouse and your friends adequate time regularly. Obviously, you are not living a balanced life. The third area is called.
about the public life. God has called us to it. He actually says, if you don't work, don't eat. What does that mean? He has called you to work on your daily bread. Don't eat other people's sweat. That's a calling. So, even if you are okay in your private life, and you are okay on your social life, if in your public life you are not allocating enough time, there's a problem. And public life refers to your profession, where you earn your daily bread. Public life refers to your church life, where you are bringing people to the Lord, or you are, you are, you are also discipling others. Public life refers to community, where you are involved with your neighbors. And you are locating the time. If you are not allocating it, you are not balanced. And of course, we can spend all our time on it. One of the things I want to emphasize is the risk of working. Doing something such that you have no time to rest. You have no time to sleep. Overworking is bad for your health. And you are the one to blame. Nobody else can control your time. We all have said to ourselves, I just need to learn to sleep less. Then I will be, I'll have, I'll be rich enough. Sleep less? God is the one who created day and night. And say night is to force you to rest. So rest is important. There is plenty of evidence that proves that it is not a good idea to reduce your sleep. Chronic sleep death raises the risk of obesity. When you are struggling with weight, maybe it's because you are not sleeping enough. And even heart diseases are people who work without rest and don't sleep. Sometimes even stroke and diabetes, all those in the short term, Lack of sleep can have significant effect on the hippocampus and an area of the brain involved in memory creation and consolidation. You keep forgetting and you wonder why. It's also bad for driving. When you are told if you did not sleep last night, well, don't drive your car now. Why? Lack of sleep makes your decision making slow. So you can see the car ahead, you know you should brake. By the time you're able to decide to brake, you're ready to hit the car in the front. It's not that you are mad, you're just tired. You did not sleep last night well. That is still a product of lack of work-life balance. You know, relationship between working hours and heart attack are very, are very high. For the study, researchers from University College London compiled data on the relationship between working hours and heart attack risk. In over 600,000 workers, that's a huge study, as well as a similar data on stroke risk in over 500 other thousand other workers. They adjusted their data to compensate for individual worker differences due to health failures such as smoking, alcohol, consumption, and physical activity. And also adjusted for the presence of other cardiac risk factors. Because even if you have a, you end up with a heart attack, maybe it, you had another problem, such as high blood pressure, diabetes, and even high cholesterol. They took all that in consideration. What was the result? They found that those who work more than 55 hours per week uh, had a 10% greater risk of heart attack and was at the 3% more likely to suffer stroke compared with those who work less than 40 hours per week. I'm sure you are hearing yourself that when you work a whole week without adequate rest, you are actually slowly committing suicide. That is lack of work-life balance. You know, hours work are not directly correlated with the value created. Don't think the more work you work, the more productive you are. There are plenty of organizations that are literally of workers who work long hours, yet do not work intelligently, and therefore fail to create health and On the other hand, there are numerous employees who pack a hefty punch only that hour. They have hours their week is only that hour. But because they work smart, they create loads of value for the organization. Oftentimes, the difference is opposed to the other. The one, other one is just doing hard work, the other one is working smart. Overwork leads to lower productivity is what I want to convince you. That putting too much effort may not necessarily you do. Uh, I'm sure you have heard of the theory Diminishing returns. And it's an economic theory, theory of diminishing returns. What the theory of diminishing returns means for every extra effort, you add more, less output power. So every addition.
additional hour, you are getting less and less until additional time is not adding to the product, to the product, to productivity. The seldom discussed website of these famous long hard work can certainly that they cannot pay the off. After working past a certain point, the quality of work, if not the quantity, the quality of work decreases. Taking a heavy mental, emotional, and physical, eventually it can diminish the quality of your life. So that in the end, like Bob Winston says of Trump Media Corporation, in the end, the repeats, because you make so many mistakes for having been too long at work, that the amount of time taken correcting your errors will cost the company much more than if you had just done good quality work. You know, that's why studies came to a conclusion that to do more than 40 hours per week may not be very wise. In 2010, we are just discovering what Henry Ford, the manufacturer of vehicles, had learned way back in the 1920s. Overwork can be costly. In other words, when you make your people overwork, it will be costly, but times it will be dangerous, inefficient, and expensive. You end up with too many accidents, sometimes you can burn the whole factory down. After conducting experiments for 12 years, Ford learned that by cutting the work pay, the work day from 10 hours, to those days they were, he was forcing his workers to do 10 hours, he brought it down to 8 hours, and the work week was, was brought down from 6 days to 5 days. He could increase total work output and reduce production costs. Can you see? He was, his people are doing less number of hours and producing more than the neighboring factory. But for two credits for the 40 hour week, he was not the first to come to the conclusion it was worth well. Throughout the 30s, 40s, and 50s, there were hundreds of studies praising the benefits of the 40 hour week. You know, as I go towards, towards finishing, there are several work life balance dates I want to debacle. The first one is made, made is that it is easier to balance when you reach the top. In other words, the reason I'm working so hard is when I get senior, I will now balance. I had to get, somebody says, I had to get to a crashing point before I realized that something had to change. That is Teresa Taylor. She goes on to say, and in my career, I read the vice president level. That's like the deputy CEO in my company. And thought it would be all easier. In fact, <laughs> she discovered it was horrible. I was missing deadlines, personal appointments, and my case school activities. And my team at work was the lowest performing. Everything was a mess. I started realizing that I had to change something or I was going to go crazy myself. Now, so what I'm saying is, if you don't learn to work, have a balanced life, right low in your career, even as a CEO, you're still not doing it. Another myth, you must either be the housewife or career woman, not both. In other words, for you to have a work-life balance, women must resign their job. Women have always worked even in the Garden of Eden and pre your Africa, and they were always mothers. You've only called to balance. Now, I'm sure those of us who are older, if you are over 50, you and you grew up in the road, you know what I'm talking about. Even after two weeks or three weeks after giving birth, your mother will be back in the garden. They will keep the baby somewhere in front, captivate, but the baby cries, they suckle the baby, then they put the baby a little further. There was no time we did not have working mothers. Mothers have always worked, but they had to balance work in the garden plus looking after their baby. Teresa Taylor goes on to say, I also noticed that many of my women co-workers were disappearing. They were throwing in the towel and either leaving the work to resort together or working part-time. I was determined to find a better way. I refused to believe that I had to choose between having a career and being a good mother and wife. I wanted both. I work hard to have both. My answer is, is to, to a shattering the balance made to integrate. In other words, you can integrate your work. You can talk to your employer and ensure that you leave work at four uh, even if that has to be taken out of the salary, and you end up with a career and you're still available to your baby. Made number three, you must choose work or family. Karen Patterson has noticed that using technology has enabled her to cultivate a work-life balance by having the ability to work remotely. And in result, she can spend more time with 
with our family. Now these days there are many jobs you can do from your house. So when the baby cries, you stop the work, you go to the baby. So she can travel with her office in her pocket, keeping the information secure and accessible. If a client asks for an file or piece of information via email, she can access it in her phone and send it from the cloud. So it is no longer necessary to have to choose. You can actually do both. The critical thing is integrating, ensuring that nothing is forgotten. Once I'm away from my desk, I'm not working. That's another theory people think. You know, I don't work. I left, I left my office at four. Technology allows us to work anytime, anywhere. Although they are free from a desk or chair, all the workers I know are tethered to their mobile devices. In other words, they are always at work. In other words, it's now harder with technology to have a work-life balance. Because some people work even at home. They are unable to put to say, now I'm not going to answer my calls. And be concentrate on your children, concentrate on your family. Even if the phone rings, ignore it. Now, so we are saying you can cheat yourself. I let the office at home, but the office follows you. So in the end, you are not sleeping enough. And you're not available to your family enough. Watch out for that. Number five, work life balance is just about hours worked. I think I've talked about that quite a bit. When it comes to work life balance, balance can be achieved. It's about much more than working long hours. It's about the purpose behind what you are doing and the reason for doing it. For instance, what you do for a living may only require 40 hours of per week. But if it's making it difficult for you to sleep at night for stress, and reasons of integrity, your work-life balance is out of work. In other words, work-life balance is not just the hours. What about if you are stealing? So at night you are so afraid of, of being caught, you can't sleep at night. You're not having a balance. You need to do the kind of job where what you did in the day does not become something you fear at night. Then you'll have balance. Six hours work are directly correlated to what you created. I think I spent a lot of time earlier telling you that's not true. There are plenty of organizations with a litany of workers who work long hours and they are not productive. So, how do you, how to keep the method, the rhythm in life rather than balance? In other words, we are saying, don't keep balance. Two hours, two hours, two hours. We keep a rhythm. The balance is when you have meaningful daily achievements. Enjoy each day of my work life quadrants. Today, how much did I earn my daily bread? Today, how much did I invest in my family? Today, how much did I spend on my friends? Today, how much did I spend on myself? Private life. That's really what you are talking about when you talk about work life. Ask yourself, when was the last time you achieved and enjoyed something at work? Because for work life balance, you must enjoy your work. What about achieved and enjoyed your family? Do you because you can allocate your family time, but you're not enjoying the time for all your friends. You can allocate them time, but you don't even want to be with them. And how recently have you achieved and enjoyed something just for you, your private time? You know, we are talking about both achievement and enjoyment. A lot of people mistake achievement for enjoyment. You can achieve without enjoying. At the core of an effective work-life balance definition, are the two key everyday concepts that are relevant for to each of us. Achievement and enjoyment. The big question. Why are you achieving? Why are you enjoying? Why do you want a better income? Don't just continually try to get rich. Why? A new house. Why? I want my thing to go through college. Why? I want to do a good job today. Why? I want to go to work. Why? Trying to live a one-sided life is why so many successful people are not happy. You can have an achievement, but because you are, you are, your work is not having meaning, you can't enjoy your night. And you are not as happy as you should be. You know, enjoyment does not just mean, ha, 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 I'm happy. It means I'm proud of what I'm doing. I'm proud of the time I have with my family. I'm satisfied. I'm happy. I'm celebrating the things God has helped me to do. I'm loving the people I'm with. I have a sense of well-being. I really enjoy my life each week, each year. Please, 
brother, have a vision and mission to live for. That's really, and my, most of you have read my books, know that's what I'm saying. Don't live other people's lives. Ask yourself, why was You do what you do. Are you aligned mentally and emotionally? And passion, you know. Inspiration drives creativity and innovation. And, um, and the clear. What I'm doing, God has called me to do. What about your values? Your core values. Values keep you in the straight and narrow. In a life of integrity. Is there something I'm doing? That is making me famous, but in my mind, I know I'm not doing something that's pleasing to God. Do I live a life of integrity? Or my retirement years will be will years of regret. Your grandfather, your grand, your dad shall say, Grandpa, how did you buy that house? When you remember what you did to get that plot, you don't know what to tell because you have two alternatives. Either you tell the truth and you are embarrassed, or you tell a lie and you live in you live in fear of that God is unhappy with you. All that because you did not do your life with integrity. No, what I'm really suggesting is that you combine your work and your personal capitals together. Don't look at your work as, as one thing and the rest of your life as another. It's one complete thing. The family is as important as earning your daily bread. Do not keep two separate calendars. One for home and one for work. One for work. You end up missing work deadlines or your case activities and other events. Have one diary. You are one person. Have one diary. And there will be time for case activities. There will be work for time for friends. There will be time for deadlines at work. So combine the calendars and integrate the two lives. Remember, you have just one life and therefore one calendar. You know, one of the things you must do is insisting on Sabbath. That doesn't mean Saturday. It means a day of rest. It's a clear message that you need rest. The biblical idea of having a Sabbath was God's way of insisting that we must have one in seven days. We must stop what you normally do. The biblical idea is just one day that stops everything. So you rest and worship. And um, most of us in Christendom use the first day of the week. God, after he six days, the first was a day of rest. And I thought you need to ask yourself, do you have a day of rest? If, I think that's what you thought of. Do you have a time? The other thing I'm recommending is that when you are doing something, don't allow your mind to be on something else. Have a diary. When I discovered that diary, Although currently I'm working, I'm looking for my wife. When I'm having time with my wife, I must stop thinking. Work does not work. So distracted by seeking work-life focus. Rather than worry about unread emails, cut through noise by giving undivided attention and focus in the moment to you are dealing with it just now. Just of the duration of the moment. So when you give your wife a date of two hours. You must. You are, a, you are a human being, not an animal. You can lock out everything else and just concentrate on that date. Once complete, I then can move out of that and go to my computer and work. That's really what we are talking about when you talk about work level. Give the next task or the next person again and divide his attention. Each one of them in the end will feel you, you spend your time well with them. I finish by asking, did Jesus have a, have a balanced day himself? You know, we, I have to suggest to you that Jesus had a balanced day. When Jesus was 12 years old, he disappeared from his parents. What did he do? He went to the temple. When his mother found him and chastised him, what did he say? I know I need to be with you, but I must also be on my father's business. Not Joseph, but the heavenly father. In other words, more. Right now, the most important thing Jesus told the mother I could be doing is learning to do what God has called me to do now. It did not mean that Jesus was not a carpenter's son and therefore worked in the carpenter's shop. But there's a time when he allocated time to just be in the temple. No time for his mother and brothers, no. He had time. Three gospel record the truth.
Jesus told the tales of a day in Jesus' life. When he is teaching great crowds and his mother and brothers show up and ask him to come home and be with them. He had already given them time. Now the family wants to come and interfere with the preaching time. As Jesus was speaking to the crowd, his mother and brothers were outside wanting to talk with him. Someone told Jesus, your mother and your brothers are outside and they want to speak to you. That is in Matthew chapter 12, verse 46 and 47. Upon hearing this request, Jesus refuses to even come to the door. Why? Because he was at the middle of his work in ministry. And we need to understand that. That you must give your family time. There must also be time to go to preach in that school if they're in student ministry. There must be time for worship. There must be time for preaching. And when you do it, do it seriously. Until your family knows, respect it. If you have a prayer time, let your children know Papa at this time is praying. You don't disturb them. What happens when you, your loved ones dies? For example, mom's dead. You may need to stop other things to be involved in, in the comforting of your brothers. Jesus loved people, although he also loved his work. He had time for friends. Didn't he pick your friends to be his ministry? He was closer to three of them only. So he had 12 disciples, but three of them. He allocated more time, and he balanced between all of them. He had time for his other ministry, despite having a heavenly calling. But on the cross, Jesus was very concerned with the welfare of his own mother, the physical mother, and his best friend, John. When Jesus saw his mother there, we read in John chapter 19, verse 26, 27, and the disciple whom he loved, standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. In other words, he was concerned enough about what would happen to the mother after he himself had gone to heaven. He was, he had interest in his family. You also must be heavenly reminded, but you must be still of other good. Jesus passionately loved people so much so that he died for all of us. So what do we learn about the work-life balance from Jesus? That wherever you are, be there. Be concentrated on what you are doing. When you are at work, be at work. Don't be on Facebook and you are pretending to be at work. Don't be on the phone every hour with your family and you are still claiming to be at work. Be a good steward of whatever task God has given you. That's what will honor God. We are at home, be there. Not on the phone. Not on the laptop. There's a time, especially those of you with small children, there's a time you must keep your phone and laptop away. Not on Facebook. Be your family. Be fully present, physically and also mentally. That's what we honor God. That's following the way Jesus did it. He lived a rhythm in his life. So, what are we saying? Four things. Number one. Avoid the dictatorship of the agent. I've run out of time. Um, I'm about to, to take 40 minutes. Uh, avoid the dictatorship of agent. Even if something is urgent, ask, is it important? Many urgent things are not important. You can ignore it and nothing serious will happen. That's the way to be able to concentrate on what you have located your time to. Some things are urgent and important. Those ones, you should stop everything to deal with them. But some things are urgent, but not that important. Number two, be displayed. What is display? Display is the ability to do what is important even when you don't enjoy doing it. Let me repeat. A disciplined person is a person who fulfills his purpose and does even things he doesn't enjoy if they are important to do. Then we say that guy is disciplined. We never say you are disciplined when you do something which you enjoy. It is when you can actually stop what you enjoy to do what is important. Number three, Plan prioritization. Prioritize on how well the item supports fulfillment of your call. You know you are calling. You are living for a purpose. What contributes to it most? Number four, have the ability to say no. That word in the dictionary is the most important. You cannot live a balanced life until you know there is a time to say yes and a time to say no. I'm open for questions.
Thank you, Brother Nganga. <coughs> As he has just said, he is open for questions. First, I, I appreciate the presentation. And I've learned several things. One, I think as life up, as as we approach forty, we are told life starts at forty. But I think there is a question I need to pose to myself about why, before I start running helter skelter, just to meet some things. And secondly, I think in my generation, I don't know the need of a calendar, rather, a need of a diary. And you have spoken much about a diary. I think it is take away home for me. Kindly let's share our questions with Brother Nganga. And you can write them in the chat, or you can, but since we are just friends, just, um, just unmute and comment. Work-life balance. I have said it's an important question. Work-life balance. What are the issues? First of all, I have emphasized Work-life balance is not a good title because they are, you are claiming you only have work and life. What is life? In my mind, at least a minimum of three things must be balanced. The time you have located to one daily bread, the time you have allocated for ministry, the time you have allocated to family and friends. You must allocate it enough time. So if you are doing ministry and your family is forgotten, you are not balanced. If you are earning your daily bread and your family and ministry is forgotten. A lot of people just balance work and family. They forget that there is still ministry before you can say you are living a balanced life. Anyway, I'm trying to provoke you to ask questions. But it doesn't have to be a question, it can be a comment. You can even add to the topic by sharing some things. 